Um, thanks to everyone who is um, attending and still arrive, you know, still arriving into this OASPA webinar. Um, it said just to thank the OASPA webinar sponsors, um, because that means that we can make the, the webinar available to, to everyone um, for free. So that's great. Um, Past webinars can be found on the OASPA website um, and we'll share that link in the chat and that will be found there soon and it will be circulated to, um, to all registrants. Um, so thank you to everyone and thank you to um, the, the panellists today who've, um, who've agreed to, um, to come and share their expertise. Um, I always think webinars are quite interesting because it can be hard to figure out who else is who else is on the call. So we've got 650 people registered for the webinar. Um, we probably expect around sort of half of those to um, to attend live. So thank you for doing so. And you're a mix of people from all over the world, um, 59 different countries, um, concentrated in the 60% in the UK and US. Um, but apart from that, we're spread over um, other countries and we've got representatives from every continent. So that's that's brilliant. Um, and coming from 480 different organisations, um, lots of them, um, academic libraries, publishing, academic research, nonprofits, charities, um, governmental and non-governmental organisations. So um, so yeah, welcome, and um, we've got a range of panelists who are bringing a breadth of perspectives here. So um, I'm sure you'll find something. Um, I'm sure you'll find something really interesting to um, to, to pique your interest. Um, I've already been welcomed in the chat. My name's Rachel, and I'm the director of product at Crossref, and. I've been doing a lot of work over the past couple of years with um, colleagues, different organisations to think about how we can better support data sharing um, across REF and across the community. Um, in terms of the webinar today, um, I guess developments um, in the US, but certainly not constrained to the US, um, helped us, you know, brought data you know back to the fore back to the fore in terms of thinking about it as a first class research output um or certainly that's how people were talking about it and i know probably some of us um on you know on the webinar today are thinking we'll hold on this is something that we've been trying to you know advocate and push into the push into the spotlight or support as a first class research object for you know for for some time so I wanted to I wanted to kind of acknowledge acknowledge that this isn't kind of a sea change this is how do we you know how do we continue to reinforce this and make progress as a community so we're lucky enough to have a group of experts from a variety of backgrounds who are thinking carefully about this what it means tangible steps to take policies around data, what we can do next in our communities of practice. Um, attendees, you're absolutely welcome to bring your own perspectives. Um, the best way to do that is to add um, questions in the Q&A box. We'll get to as many as we can during the course of the webinar, um, but panellists will be asked to submit responses to any unasked, answered questions afterwards. And we'll also have time for discussion. So we'll address questions at the end after all of the panellists have had time to speak. So as I said, welcome to our panellists, um, Sarah, Arvin, Shelley and Kathleen. Um, and I'll introduce them in more detail before each of their talks. So both will, each will speak for about 12, 12 minutes, um, which still gives us time for discussion at the end. So we've got um, our first speaker, um, Sarah Lippincott, who is a librarian and library consultant with a decade of experience supporting open access, digital scholarship and scholarly communications through st strategic planning, research, service design, facilitation and um, community and 
and communications work. Um, she's head of communi community engagement at Dryad and works with institutions, funders and researchers to increase awareness of an engagement with data sharing and data reuse. So she's going to bring that perspective to, um, to our talk today from policies to from policies themselves to supporting those policies and the principles behind them via connection, interoperability, identifiers and metadata. So I'll stop speaking and pass over to you. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks very much, Rachel. I'm going to share my, my screen. Um, uh, as Rachel said, I'm Sarah Lippincott. I'm head of community engagement at Dryad. And I'm here to offer a repository perspective on data sharing in the context of evolving policies and open science practices. I'm going to briefly introduce you to Dryad in case you're not already familiar with us. I'll review some pertinent highlights from the Nelson memo and NIH policies, two of the major developments that are impacting data sharing over the next few years, especially in the US. And I'll end with thoughts about how Dryad is responding to these shifts in collaboration with scholarly journals and with researchers and, and the research community. Dryad is an open international data publishing platform and community committed to the open availability and routine reuse of all research data. Since our founding in 2008, we have curated and published nearly 50,000 data sets representing the work of nearly 200,000 researchers at nearly 70,000 institutions around the world. And our data sets are connected to research articles in over 1,200 leading academic journals. We were founded as a home for data underlying published research with the notion that a non-specialist repository can serve as shared infrastructure for a large and diverse set of journals to help them realize their data sharing goals. All of the data in Dryad is fully curated. That's a signature part of, of our prop process and, and one of the things that I think is, is critical to um, understanding and, and supporting the, the new um, policies coming out of the United States. We're also nonprofit and community led. We're supported by a coalition of member organizations that include academic publishers, as well as, as universities and research institutes. Um, in 2003, we still have a long way to go towards realizing the vision that, that Dryad started defining in 2008. Even among journals that encourage or require data sharing, data availability statements like the one pictured here remain the norm. Numerous studies have shown that a minority of data availability statements include a direct link to the data in a repository, and other studies show that authors routinely ignore or deny the sharing requests, uh, even when they post a statement like this alongside their article. New policies and guidance from federal agencies and funders make clear that this type of data sharing is no longer sufficient. They, the, these policies are a reflection of a growing push for greater collaboration, transparency, and accountability in scientific research, an assertion that the open sharing of data underpinning research is essential to achieving the benefits of open science, that researchers and the general public have a right to access the, the, that underlying data, and that its value lies in its usability. The White House Office of Science and Technology Policy's memo on ensuring free, immediate, and equitable access to federally funded research, also known as the Nelson memo, will begin to roll out this month with the federal, the larger federal agencies required to submit new or revised access policies that align with the, the memo's guidance by late February. And new public access policies across all agencies of the US uh, federal government uh, will be in effect no later than December 2025. So it's a short time frame to put together a lot of infrastructure and processes to accommodate all of the data affected by this policy. So billions of dollars worth of funded research. The updated policy sets high expectations for federal agencies to improve research integrity and reproducibility by requiring immediate open deposit of data underlying scholarly research. The memo, the memo indicates that data should be available concurrently with a related research publication or before the end of the funding period, whichever comes first. 
Um, it also instructs agencies to develop plans for open deposit of data, even when it's not associated with a research publication. This is an area that will have less of an impact on publishers, but a profound one on academic institutions who are going to require scalable technical solutions, increased staffing and funding to deal with a wave of data sets that historically might never have entered the scholarly record. They might have remained on a researcher's laptop or, or been lost to the, the sands of time. The Nelson Memo encourages the use of repositories that align with the National Science and Technology Council's desirable characteristics of data repositories for federally funded research, which is a set of desirable characteristics that are designed to help government agencies provide guidance on, on trustworthy places to share and archive their data. These characteristics, characteristics cover a range of features from organizational sustainability to data quality assurance, and they'll help ensure that the data um, shared in accordance with federal policies is broadly accessible, robustly curated, and preserved over the long term. And you can read about how Dryad uh, specifically aligns with these characteristics at the link on the slide, bit.ly slash dryad nstc. Um, and lastly, the, the, policy, the memo calls for research outputs to be described with robust metadata, including author and co-author information, publication date, persistent identifiers that aid in the discovery, reuse, and preservation of, of the data. So again, merely posting to a website is no longer sufficient. There needs to be the appropriate metadata that supports, uh, supports the data and supports its, um, its interpretation by others. Um, the National Institutes of Health data sharing policy, which went into effect in January, closely parallels the Nelson Memo's expectations. The NIH uh, policy applies to all the research that is funded or conducted in whole or in part by NIH um, that produces scientific data. Like the OSTP memo, this includes data whether or not it's used to support a research publication. And as the largest public funder of biomedical research in the world, the NIH policy alone affects billions of dollars of research grants each year. NIH expects researchers to develop data management plans that maximize the appropriate sharing of scientific data where legally, ethically, and technically feasible. Like the Nelson memo, the NIH policy asserts a strong preference for scientific data to be shared and preserved through trusted repositories rather than kept only by the researcher or institution and provided upon request. It states that data should be shared without embargo and no later than the release of an associated publication or end of the funding period. And to prevent data sharing from becoming, a, quote, a perfunctory administrative requirement, the policy also specifically includes a provision regarding data and metadata quality assurance. The policy states that data should be of sufficient quality to validate and replicate research findings. So merely archiving data for the purposes of, uh, of compliance would fail to realize the intent of these policies and, and, the, um, and even the, the kind of underlying um, requirements. Um, just to, to think for a minute, why is open data sharing important to the White House and the NIH and other research funders? There are there are a number of reasons, and I think they're relevant to to point to um, in this context. Reusable open data promotes scientific integrity by providing evidence to support research articles and enabling experts to interrogate, validate, and reproduce findings. Access to open data can accelerate discovery by enabling collaboration and real-time sharing of knowledge. We saw a compelling example of this during the early days of the COVID-19 pandemic. Dryad, for example, has COVID-related data sets like those pictured here dating from as early as April 2020. Open data promotes innovation and provides economic opportunity. GPS is one striking example of this. Um, the open availability of GPS enables billions of dollars of economic activity every year. And finally, open data is a public good. It gives taxpayers access to the research they fund, and it advances equity by allowing researchers, including those from less resourced institutions or regions of the world, to work with data that they might not be able to generate themselves, but, are, but that are relevant to their challenges and interests. 
That's why realizing the intent of these policies is more than posting a link to a spreadsheet online, and I'm, I'm deliberately oversimplifying there, but journals and repositories have a lot of common goals here to ensure that we're enabling all of those functions of open data, all of the promises of data sharing and reuse, not just supporting policy compliance. So I want to talk about a, a few of the ways our goals align. And I think all of these come down to a focus on reuse, which I know some of my colleagues will talk about further um, in their presentations as well. Reuse in all its shapes and forms. Thinking of data like a research article as a living asset, a part of a scholarly conversation that exists to be interrogated, validated, and built upon. From a repository perspective, our technology and our processes should enable all of these forms of reuse and more. I'll briefly describe a few of a few of the ways that we're accomplishing this at Dryad. We ensure metadata and data quality. We do this in a number of ways, but primarily we do this through curation. Every data set published with Dryad undergoes a hands-on curation process that evaluates metadata and data files to ensure that they're suitable for sharing, that metadata is sufficient to support reuse, and that data files can be opened and interpreted. We continue ensuring quality well after publication. Metadata requires care and feeding. Um, practices change over time. New standards emerge. New persistent identifiers become available. And Dryad re actively recurates data over time. For example, when the research organization registry became available, Dryad not only began systematically including uh, ROR IDs in all new submissions, we retroactively applied them to our entire corpus. With the huge influx of data, expected post Nelson memo and an NIH policy, we need to think about how we continue to do this effectively at scale. And how do we ensure that we continue to offer a high quality coherent collection and not a free for all. So we're already conducting automatic automated checks on tabular data at the point of submission using a software called frictionless data. And we're exploring additional opportunities for this kind of pre curation validation before a data set ever moves into human curation. We're also looking at capturing additional metadata through machine learning and enhancing our discovery mechanisms. Essential context for interpreting data can also come from related research artifacts, including software and code, research articles, preprints, other data sets, and data management plans. We, can sit, we, uh, we encourage authors to link these to their Dryad data sets. And we integrate with other scholarly infrastructures to make sure that we are building that connection of, of related outputs. We support this largely through persistent identifiers, which we incorporate wherever we possibly can throughout our, our corpus, as you can see here. Um, and uh, finally, um, we want to ensure that data is available not, not only immediately as the policies require, but over the long term. And this is one of the most obvious issues with the data availability upon request um, uh, statement relying on any individual researcher to provide access breaks down very quickly when you're talking about a scale of years and decades. Data repositories like Dryad, which has earned a core trust seal certification, are equipped to support long-term preservation and access, stewarding data as a key element of the scholarly record. Um, if you have uh, any questions that I'm not able to answer, answer during this session, you can reach out to me at sarah at datadryad.org, and you can read more about Dryad's response to each of the policies I've mentioned on our blog via the links on this slide. Thanks very much. Awesome. Sarah, thank you so much. That was um, that was a great, a great talk to start us off and um, and to be able to provide that that context. Um, apologies for the issue with the chat. We've resolved those. So um, it's great to see, I guess, the the range of participants and where you're all coming from. So just to, to reiterate the, the welcome. Um, our next speaker is, um, is Shelley Saul. Um, Shelley is the Senior Director for the American Geophysical Union's Data Leadership Program. Um, she works with AGU's members, their organizations, and the, um, the broader research community to improve data and digital object 
practices with the ultimate goal of elevating how research um, data is managed and valued. We could probably give a nod to, to software as well. So as you can see from Shelley's slides, um, she's going to provide um, an insight into data sharing within scientific societies. And that's by posing the questions, how is the journey so far? And are we there yet? Which certainly seemed fitting in light of the title of the webinar um, in general. So um, I see what you've done there. <laughs> Um, but thank you, and over to you. We are not there yet. <laughs> so, but um, we do have a number of us on this journey, and it sure will take us all to get there. Um, so, uh, really great to get the um, information um, from my colleagues. And uh, let me just dig in. So, so this is going to be more about AGU's um, experience, but we're also um, uh, working with a number of colleagues across the scientific societies within the natural sciences and beyond, and uh, other communities as well, not only our own membership. So I'm going to share some of that with you, and hopefully there's uh, 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 things that you can take away for your own communities or, or help join ours. So I'm going to talk about things we're doing with our membership, um, things we are doing for our journals and journal guidance, uh, and specific publication workflow uh, efforts that we're actually partnering with Rachel and the folks at Crossref and a number uh, of others, I think that are probably even on this, uh, in this participating in this, uh, this uh, event, um, and then the broader society. And I will challenge you uh, how we can all work together um, uh, and areas that you're probably already working in and highlighting those. So, so let's dig in very quickly. So one of the reasons AGU cares so much about data sharing and software sharing, we have had a position statement on data for, oh gosh, almost 30 years. And uh, Earth and space science data, Earth, space, and environmental science data, they're a world heritage. Um, that tsunami is not repeatable. That volcanic activity, that seismic activity, things that are happening in the planetary systems, these are not repeated events. And it matters that the observations are captured and used to learn more about the phenomenon of our Earth and the universe, um, and that that is uh, preserved and shared, and it's uh, ethically available, et cetera. And you can, um, this is about a two-page position document. Um, this guides our work. Uh, it guides the fact that uh, I actually work at AGU. It's one of the reasons I'm there. So. Um, one of the things that we do for our researchers is try to provide more information. So data sharing is a really critical component of open science. So we have some new materials that we've just put out. Uh, and this was this came from work that we've done with the Belmont Forum uh, grant that we have, which is a six country grant, um, talking about how you can move uh, in your journey as a researcher, as, a, as your team in the community and beyond. Um, those materials are available. You can use that QR code to gain access. Um, and we're, we're just really delighted to help folks see from where they are as a researcher. This includes your ORCID, includes persistent identifiers, how to do uh, document your data. A lot of the work that's happening at Dryad and other repositories uh, with making sure citations and data are treated as a first-class research product and that they're cited within journals and researchers have what they need to actually do that. And we promote that and we talk about it as um, things that you can do as researchers, things that you can do as teams and beyond. So we want people to be comfortable with what does this mean and give them tangible ways to do it that they can do right now with the resources they have right now. Um, to help, there is, uh, we partner with the Earth, uh, uh, Earth Science Information Partners. Uh, this is run by um, Susan Schinkeldecker and Megan Carter. Um, and we uh, collaborate with them to make sure we get to a, a bunch of uh, uh, different uh, meetings, uh, you know, heavy support for our own meeting, which just happened in December. This is the promotions from that meeting. Uh, we are about, uh, uh, ESIP is about to collaborate with the um, AMS, the American Meteor Meteorological Society. Um, actually, they just did. It was in January. Uh, and we're now planning for the European Geoscience Union uh, coming up in just a, a couple months to get ready to bring the help desk there and have experts 
experts uh, work with researchers to actually answer those questions. And leaning into the future, we're looking for funding right now to make this a 24-7 operation with a knowledge base, partnering with as many people as possible to provide relevant answers, no matter where you are, no matter who you are, to uh, help you with your data sharing, software sharing. So if you're interested in partnering, just send me a note. Um, it's, it's not too late and we're, uh, we're working on that right now. So uh, we also provide um, in an open way, this is a this is actually uh, something that's openly available to anyone. The guidance we give our authors for data and software sharing, um, answering uh, questions and giving them like what, how, where, when, um, such that that Holdren memo uh, that is now uh, uh, you know uh, in effect across the U.S. the European Commission's requirements. Uh, what's required out of Australia and a number of other countries is possible to actually uh, comply with. Um, so we know a number of publishers uh, use our guidance uh, uh, to, to inform their own. We welcome that. We welcome feedback. Um, and you're, you know, you're happy to explore that further. Um, and anything, uh, any improvements, we're open to that as well. Please, you know, please do, please do do that. Um, this, all of these resources can be found on our website, data.agu.org. This is actually hosted on GitHub, so you can interact with us there, um, uh, providing uh, uh, comments and issues and pull requests. Um, and we try to provide information, uh, digital presence, what to do with your ORCID, how do you cite Jupyter Notebooks, what does it mean to do a software citation. Uh, for those of you who love, uh, as Dryad is uh, certified in Core Trust Seal, what does that mean? Um, and we have that there. Uh, so please, those are things that are all uh, openly available to anyone, um, and you're you're welcome to explore those, use those as you see fit. Um, then we also have on that website uh, blog posts for things that are not fully vetted through a community, but yet researchers have questions. Very large data sets are incredibly hard to work with. So we provide the best possible information in blog posts so that you can know what to do with what's available now. It's not pretty. Um, it doesn't fully comply with best practices just because there are few repositories out there that can handle multiple terabytes into petabytes. What do you do? How do you handle it? What what will AGU be okay with? Um, and it uh, uh, we, we're really delighted to try to give you the best possible answers. Um, and if anybody has updates on what this says in here, I'm happy to, to continue to evolve this guidance. Um, and... Uh, ORCID, uh, how do you take advantage of digital presence and using what's available to you to connect the dots? Uh, uh, we, you know, making sure that your publications are automatically connected in a digital way to your online profile. You connect your CV, you're using it to your best possible advantage. What you can do right now, we have a tutorial um, and we have guidance. Uh, currently it's in English, but in the next couple months, you're going to see this same guidance coming out in uh, multiple languages, uh, Japanese, French, Portuguese, Spanish, um, Chinese, and I feel like I'm missing a couple languages, but uh, we'll have this in multiple languages very soon. Uh, our, our editors love this particular slide. They love the simple algorithm that how do you actually create the best possible data and software citation, um, preserving that data in a trusted repository, citing it within your paper, describing it within uh, the open research section. This is our availability section for AGU, so you're, you're happy to change that those vocabulary. This is what looks like a well-cited uh, data set or a well-cited software. Um, our editors love this slide. This makes it, this breaks it down. We realize the doing of this actually takes a, a bit more work, but um, this helps people realize what it takes to actually get to the end goal. Um, so these are these are tools that we provide. This is education that we provide uh, to our editors, our reviewers, to our authors, to our own publishing staff. Um, so uh, within our membership. This is content that we provide. Um, and now, now let me um, highlight some of the work that we're doing uh, in conjunction with the broader community. Uh, Crossref has been a huge 
uh, uh, support for this, as well as folks at NISO with JATS and for our, our journal publishing folks. Um, we just published a preprint that is incredibly valuable, digging through all of the reasons why automated data and software citations are not working and what it takes for you to actually get that to, uh, to work cor uh, correctly. Um, and we uncover all of the uh, really nitty gritty of why there are challenges. Um, if you're not part of the journal community and you are frustrated with why your data citation from your paper never made it into being recognized, um, please take the document, take a look at it. You can explore uh, the pipeline that you're using, the journal selections that you're using, um, and ask the questions. Uh, what's happening? How do I know that my citations are making it through to credit and attribution in a way that that should be happening? Uh, we actually lay it all out for you. Um, this will also be presented in the upcoming NISO Plus uh, uh, session for 2023, helping the other our other journal friends. Um, but please share this broadly. Um, it is being submitted <clears throat> for peer review shortly, so um, hopefully it will improve over time with that feedback, but you are welcome to comment on it right now within uh, its current uh, preprint uh, instantiation. Um, and happy to answer questions on that. It's very in the weeds. Welcome to the weeds. Um, for our uh, society friends, we partnered um, in recent years on a data sharing seminar series for societies. And in 2023, we will actually do this again for open science, um, a little bit broader context and uh, making it relevant across societies, um, exploring different challenges within open science, building on data sharing, building on software sharing, um, and helping, uh, especially those holder and memo concerns, the concerns that the European Commission has, um, and uh, expanding on those within that seminar series. So watch for that. Um, but you're also welcome to explore the existing um, data sharing ones. We have some super popular um, uh, recordings that uh, are still, you know, viewed a thousand times and shared widely. So there's a lot of really interesting content out there right now. Um, so here's the challenges I have for you. So even though all of that is happening, it all continues to be hard because we have uh, cultural challenges and infrastructure challenges and funding challenges. And uh, let me walk you through the four areas that AGU is continuing to push forward on for open science, um, because by practicing that, which includes data sharing, which includes software sharing, um, we can actually push benefit for humanity um, and uh, open up uh, science to be more accessible, more inclusive. And that's really critical for the really complex challenges, international teams that are out there. Um, the first one being uh, uh, the you know, working together to empower these data citations. I walked you through the paper that just came out. This particular project that is depicted here uh, in uh, the graphic, some of you will say, but Shelly, that's not the best way to do it. That's fine. It was an early graphic. Um, it really led to that paper. Um, why uh, we ex we went through all of these different pieces of um, journal publication, the data repositories, how things get to Crossref, how things get to Datacite, how they get to Scholix. And it was a, a multi-layered process to figure out where the challenges were. That paper walks you through that research, the collaboration we had with the Force 11 uh, Journal Task Force. And um, so it was done with uh, a number of contributing uh, communities to make it really robust and work through all of those issues for all of us. Um, and it, it's, we're not finished yet. Um, there's a lot more work to do. And uh, the fact that the um, uh, grants have the opportunity to actually elevate the importance. Um, how do we celebrate through funders and other stakeholders the value that data and software generated through a grant has? Um, and how can we um, uh, you know, make that part of the intellectual merit and make that something that's reported in public access repositories and incredibly, uh, you know, no matter what funder you're talking to, um, this is starting to happen, but we really need to push this as a, you know, the, that data management plan shouldn't be a one-off. It shouldn't be something that is, oh, the file is there. We really need to care about the fact that it's hitting the right repository. 
Um, and uh, that data is then available for reuse and it's well documented and it is a contribution as well as any publication. Um, and the software is a contribution um, as well as the data and the publication. So this, this, you know, embracing this as an actual output um, uh, is incredibly valuable to our community moving forward. Um, and that impact statement within any of our proposals and the reports that come out every year needs to include these things. So that's the uh, the, the opportunity we have for uh, those folks that are doing proposals and funders that might be online. Um, and uh, what does it mean to actually have a really robust repository infrastructure? Um, you know, working with uh, Dryad, working with other general repositories, they are incredibly important to our community. We have to have them. More than 60% of the data sets that are submitted for AGU journals, more than 60% go to general repositories. They are incredibly important. But what happens is we don't have enough guidance for our researchers on what is curation required. Dryad is really paving the way for how to do that for a generalist repository. We need that to be across the board and we need our researchers to realize why it's important. If we can't understand what that data is, the value diminishes greatly immediately. How do we make it better? How do we work together? How do we bring um, that curation expectation at a higher level? And um, for, for those domains where a domain repository is critical, how do we make sure that's available to researchers? It's a complex problem and everybody has to be part of the solution. And we really need to talk about this more. Um, institutional repositories, also incredibly important. They are accessible to research researchers immediately. How do we make them accessible to international teams coming from multiple institutions? How do we make sure the curation is um, really robust there as well? This is hard, very hard. Um, and finally, reward systems. How do we reward um, behaviors about sharing data, about open science? Um, how do we do that? Uh, we have a number of things we're doing at AGU. We just approved a brand new Open Science Award that it has just been announced, um, and there will be uh, winners coming this December. Um, and Open Science is very tied to diversity, inclusion, equity, and justice. Um, and we have to recognize that by making uh, science more accessible, um, and we do that also through our uh, our journals, our open access journals, which we've just flipped the largest journal we have just a few days ago. Uh, we're really proud of that. Um, how do we make sure equity is there? And where we reward those behaviors such that researchers see the value of doing them if they have a choice. Um, and uh, promotion and tenure shows that value and researchers are re rewarded through universities. Uh, and we reinforce that and work together uh, in lockstep uh, to show researchers that this is important. Um, and that is my last slide. And thank you all so much for the opportunity to talk to you today. And I will stop there. Cool. Um, Shelley, thank you so much. Um, it's, it's um it's such I think kind of a diverse range of approaches um but as you said that you know different communities different stakeholders are involved and um we need to be able to kind of provide resources to them that speak to that speak to the how I, I'm always kind of a high person how do we do this how do we figure this out and um so it's it's great to hear about that both in terms of what AGU is doing and also the kind of the broader thinking about how we can we can do that as a as a community um so yeah thank you um I'm going to move on to our next speaker so Arvin Venkatesan is a senior data science scientist with the literature services group um Embo EBI. Um, he's got a background in molecular biology and holds a doctoral degree in the application of knowledge graphs in biological hypothesis generation. He's experienced in data representation and integration by applying ontologies and knowledge graph related technologies in the life science domain. So 
At EMBL EBI, Arvind has extensively worked on literature data integration and with a focus on the verification of text mind outputs, which he's going to talk to us about today, um, as well as the, the workflows needed to support those. So thank you for joining us. Um, I'll, I'll give you the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, thank the organizers for giving uh, me the opportunity to present the work that um, the literature services are, are doing towards um, sort of bringing uh, biological data that is uh, associated with literature uh, to the wider uh, scientific community, uh, making it uh, findable, accessible, interoperable, and um, reusable. Uh, I think each one of this is extremely important if we want to take the uh, you know, scientific research to the next level. Um, and uh, yeah, today I will be talking uh, about uh, what we have done in this space. Uh, before I move on to uh, how we have done it, I would like to give an introduction towards uh, our resource. That is, uh, we host uh, here at the Literature Service, we host the uh, European C uh, uh, database. It is a, a free a digital archive for uh, biomedical and life science research publications. We provide comprehensive access across uh, different type of publications, be it uh, abstracts, associated metadata, uh, full text articles, preprints, and also uh, full text preprints. So we are able to provide you information across all this uh, uh, content. Um, European C is supported by 37 international scientific funders, and it is uh, hosted by EMBLEBI, and uh, it's a primary choice of uh, for these funders. What we do here is, um, here at the Literature Services, we consider uh, scientific publication essentially as an information platform, because there are different layers to a scientific publication, there is information about the authors, uh, organization uh, affiliations, the associated data, the assertion that's been made, and uh, you know, grant information. So it, it's it's sort of it's a complex layered uh, um, sort of information stack, as you can you can put it that way. What what we do is we try to unpack this uh, and reflect that and make, make it shareable via our services. Most importantly, at, at every level, we, we, uh, we try uh, our best to make it fair by uh, associating it with the appropriate identifiers, for example, orchids. And if you're uh, looking at biological data, it, uh, it, uh, you're looking for a specific uh, uh, grounding it to a specific uh, database. So we make, we make sure that this complex information is uh, easily accessible. And um, this is where we are sort of taking uh, more uh, initiative towards um, mining data from uh, the literature and uh, creating a more interconnected data ecosystem. Uh, backed by uh, latest technologies such as uh, uh, machine learning and other uh, engineering solutions that would support uh, this ecosystem where data could be shared and linked appropriately. Uh, naturally, this has an impl uh, implication on uh, uh, the ease of searching uh, data and um, it, it uh, highly supports uh, specific stakeholders like uh, curators and bioinformaticians and data scientists. And um, so this has been a constant effort for us. And uh, specifically in the last few years, we have concentrated on uh, exposing and sharing of biological data specifically. Um, biological data can have different uh, definitions, but in this specific context, I mean um, anything to do with uh, database identifiers or what are known as accession numbers. So we try to uh, 
as much as possible represent the data footprint uh, behind an, uh, a literature, uh, scientific literature. And um, we do this uh, essentially in two ways. One is uh, explicit data links. The other one is uh, implicit data mentions. So what these two are, let's see. One is um, the explicit data links is slightly straightforward. Uh, here, if you see uh, a typical data section uh, in the uh, Europe DMC website, you will see that there are um, there's a section called data that cites an article. That is, it's, it, it is simple that uh, a corresponding database knows what uh, publication they have used or they have cited in their data records. And we sort of collaborate with the database uh, or data resource and make those links. These are sort of known links. Whereas there is the whole world that is uh, sort of uh, untapped. That is uh, what you can call as a known unknown, where um, there are data database accession numbers that are mentioned in the uh, publication, but the uh, data resources don't know about it, or um, the uh, funders who have funded a specific study, and as a result, it's been submitted to a data resource. They don't know about this. So we make this. Uh, uh, we sort of bring this to the surface, as we call it, as the data behind the article, where the implicit mentions of data, that is accession numbers, are being shared with the wider scientific community. And uh, there is a sort of a detailed process behind this, where uh, currently what we do is we uh, are in constant touch with uh, various uh, uh, data managers of the data biological data resources and we uh, identify patterns based on the uh, based, based on the individual accession numbers database accession numbers and we run the tagger to all the entire content of um, european c be it abstracts full text articles uh, and specifically full text articles and uh, we are able to uh, share this uh, via uh, the API. And of course, there's a detailed uh, process that goes on where we make sure that the accession numbers that we are picking up, the patterns that we are picking up are valid ones and they are not, because it is ex unlike other concepts, like if you're um, mining for uh, genes or disease mentions, um, Accuracy is of prime importance here. So we take extra care to uh, validate these accession numbers and ground them or resolve them to the appropriate uh, data source. Um, and by our APIs, we make this uh, available for uh, the larger scientific community to consume it. And we also uh, display it in our website, <clears throat> which subsequently can be used for uh, purposes of uh, documentation and reports, uh, to name a few. So uh, we make sure that we are consistent in uh, the uh, the way we share data. So we provide that we provide this data as a bulk download. As I mentioned, it's also available uh, via the website. And we for the API specifically, what we have done is we have adopted the uh, W3C recommended web annotation data model, which allows um, these uh, uh, the the mine data to be shared uh, in a fair way by you know, sort of grounding specific information. For instance, which section of the article the uh, data is mentioned, and which uh, um, and, and uh, sort of mapping it to the appropriate ontology. So what makes uh, the end result is that it is interoperable with other data sets out there, you know, uh, other biological data sets. This allows, let's say, sort of bioinformatician to sort of build a bioinformatics uh, workflows, for instance. And there is, so this adds more value uh, to the um, more value and veracity 
to the data and the assertions that are being made. Um, one of the uh, key use cases for this sort of mining is um, sort of metrics for mon monitoring purposes. Um, so what we are doing currently is we are working with uh, Elixir, which is a pan-European organization, which aids in uh, supporting uh, bioinformatic resources across uh, Europe. Um, and uh, of course the EBI, where the, the, they use these uh, accession number mentions uh, as a as a metric to to show how, um, how to show how important these resources are. Of course, uh, this is uh, this metric is a cog in a bigger wheel, but it certainly adds more um, importance towards. Uh, making an argument as to why a specific resource should uh, be supported and continued funding should be provided because it gives you a sort of a map of the usage of these resources so this is uh, this is made available only because uh, there is full text articles and we are able to mine them and uh, share it with the wider community so currently what we are looking at is we are mining for over. Uh, we are mining for forty-seven data resources, and currently we are um, we have close to nine million uh, database access number mentions. And uh, as we speak, we are working with more uh, data resources to uh, add their access numbers to our uh, tagger so that it can be uh, similar services can be provided to them as well. So this is possible, again, I would like to reiterate that this is possible only because uh, there is full text. And what we have seen, so although there are mentioned with the data in abstract, but it is the full text that where we are able to get more information out of. And um, this leads to another user story where um, it is totally sort of um, different from you know uh, uh, reporting and uh, uh, documenting and metrics and this is more of bioinformatics workflows where we were, we collaborated uh, with uh, researchers from the Westlife project it's a European project where they were trying to understand uh, and extract protein residues from publications and even in this project what they did was uh, they used uh, protein uh, data bank identifiers to sort of um, extract uh, co-mentions of uh, protein residues and uh, uh, protein data bank uh, access number mentions. So this is possible again, because we were able to share, uh, we were able to mine these uh, access numbers and share it and make it available via the API. and. Um, um, yes, and uh, so we are sort of uh, um, working and trying to understand how data can be used. And currently, uh, uh, my colleagues are working on uh, understanding. Uh, they are they are uh, conducting user research and trying to understand uh, what other user stories are there where we could serve um, them better. So uh, if, if, if you are interested to contribute uh, in this effort, please do contact us. And uh, I would like to uh, conclude my talk and uh, thank you for the opportunity. Oh, thank you, thank you so much for, um, for walking us through that. I think, as you said, the, you know, I'm, I think I'm always very impressed by the, I think the care and the attention to data that, um, you know, that, that Europe PMC and Emble EBI do. Obviously we work together on things like grant identifiers, but also the fact that those, you know, the information that you're collecting and curating is, is openly available in turn, then means that we can, you know, we can look to ingest that back into, the community to use that to build knowledge and um and as you said explore how we can support 
more use cases and other other user stories. So, um, yeah, thank you very much for um, for your talk. Um, our last speaker today has um, is um, is Kathleen Gregory. Um, Kathleen is a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Vienna and the Scholarly Communications Lab at the University of Ottawa. Um, Kathleen, I was thinking about, I think, the, the sort of recent, one of the recent papers from the Skullcom Lab talking about, if we're talking about kind of mining full text, all of the different ways that data um, appears there. Um, Kathleen holds a PhD in Science and Technology Studies, a Master of Science in Library and Information Science, and a Master's of Art and Education. Um, her research focuses on data practices in scholarly and science communications, particularly practices of data care and curation and what those practices afford. Um, the reason we thought she'd be a great um, a great panelist today is that a lot of her research um, projects investigate how people discover, make sense of and reuse research data in academia and in public life. So you can see today she's going to talk, um, bring a researcher perspective to talk about tensions in data sharing and reuse. Um, and also, I think that kind of tricky balance between practice and policy that some of our other colleagues have talked to. So thank you, Kathleen. I'll pass over to you. Great. Yeah, thanks very much, Rachel. Um, and thank you for the invitation to participate and to all of the other panelists who have also presented really great perspectives that I think will tie in really well with this, this final bit of the panel today. Um, so as Rachel said, my work really looks at these different practices, what people are actually doing from the perspective of researchers themselves. Um, so I'm looking at how researchers are engaging in these practices of managing data, sharing data, discovering data, et cetera. But when we are talking about data sharing and data reuse, I think it's important to remember that we're actually talking about this and a host of practices which overlap with each other. And often we see these depicted in somewhat um, cyclical or uh, directional life cycle models, but really these sometimes do not occur that way. They occur kind of overlapping and they're interwoven with each other. So for example, when researchers are discovering data as they read the academic literature, or when they find a data repository with interesting data, which they'll reuse later, as they're composing a, a data management plan. So I think this overlap is important as we think about how to design policies and infrastructures to support research data practices. But I also bring it up here because I'm going to just draw in a couple of examples from my past research, which take into account these various data practices to illustrate these, these four tensions, um, there are points of tension that I wanted to discuss today that I think we need to continue to really think about in this in the space of data practices in scholarly communication. So the first point of tension that I would raise is a recurring and persistent theme that we encounter when thinking about data in research. And that is just the sheer diversity of data which are needed and produced by researchers. I and mean, we know that what serves as data for one researcher in one situation may not count for data uh, as data for another in another situation. So a paleontologist, for example, who's studying the fossil record will have a very different notion of idea than uh, of data than a biblical scholar who's working with digitized texts um, or a researcher who's studying oil flows and pipelines. I love this quote from Christine Borgman that one person's signal is another person's noise when it comes to data. So we also know from my work and from work of other researchers that uh, researchers need a variety of different types of data in their work. For example, we see that researchers need both quantitative data and qualitative data or observational data, as Shelley was describing, or data that's produced from, from a lab uh, in the course of their academic work. So this, this raises tensions in thinking about how researchers can discover and access and understand this diverse data, which may be, well, probably is stored in different places, um, in different repositories. And here, of course, is again where metadata and documentation play a really key role in helping researchers to not only discover data, but to make sense of the data that, that they do find. 
But again, here's the tension of diversity, because we also know that we have a diversity in types of metadata schemas, in the types of documentation um, that researchers use. So researchers bring together information from metadata fields, from data dictionaries, from related publications, as Aravind was saying. Um, but they also use other things such as online forums where there are posts about working with data. So they bring together all of these different types of information as they evaluate data for reuse. Um, but there are also a variety of different metadata schemas, as I said, and these, these practices of researchers are often complicated as they have to become accustomed to different metadata, um, different ways of documentation, and also the challenge that being that these different metadata um, descriptions are not always complete, as was mentioned in Sarah's Sarah's work earlier at Dryad as they're going through this process of, of curating data and working on, on that issue. So another point of thinking about diversity here, we often think about diversity of data or diversity of practices in terms of disciplinary domains. But we know also that researchers belong to many different communities, which are shaped by factors beyond just their discipline. And here I just like to tell the story of um, a researcher whom I interviewed, I'll call him Mario, this is not his real name, who works as a clinician at a hospital in Europe while also belonging to a research group in North America, hence the maps here on the slide. And in the research group in North America, he's working to develop um, fuse, uh, ways for fusing spinal cords together. But each of these different communities that Mario is a part of uses data for different purposes and has different policies and attitudes to making data available for, for other people. And some of these are, of course, shaped by different legal restrictions, but also by different national policies. And it's suffice it to say that these practices and norms of these different communities are not always in alignment. In one group, Mario is encouraged to share his data, for example, and in another group, that is something that is totally not allowed. So he also has to adapt his policies and his practices um, depending on which community he's operating in at a certain time. So this raises attention uh, in how to account for diversity both across different disciplines, but also in how we can expand our notion of communities which researchers belong to and which they may need support in. So this brings me to my second point of tension, which kind of builds on this idea of, of diversity of data and diversity of practices. And this is that data practices are also dynamic and there can be a tension between new or developing practices and ones which are really rooted in the old way of doing things um, or traditional norms. So here I'd like to draw on some recent work, which Rachel actually mentioned at the beginning, which was conducted as a part of the Meaningful Data Counts Project, which I'm a part of at the Scholarly Communications Lab, along with a host of other really wonderful researchers who are listed here in the citation to the preprint of this article. Um, but in this article, we conducted a recent survey about data citation practices using a representative sample of researchers according to their academic discipline uh, in the Web of Science database. And here we see the, a question where we asked researchers to report the frequency of the methods which they use to cite or reference data when they reuse data. And we can see just that there's a wide variety of different mechanisms, including data mentions, which Aravind mentioned, um, which can occur throughout the body of a publication. They can occur in acknowledgments or in appendixes uh, as a footnote. We also see that researchers in our sample do report actually citing data in reference lists, which is encouraging. They also report um, using a citation to a related paper in a reference list as a way of citing data. So while we see some, um, and I, should, I want to emphasize here, this is at the very broad level of our sample. And in the paper, we do look at disciplinary differences in, in much more detail. But I think what's interesting here is one, the tie to past traditional practices uh, of citation, for example, citing papers over data or citing footnotes, which we found to be a more of a common practice, or citing using footnotes, which we found to be more of a common practice by researchers in the humanities. And then the second point that I think is interesting here is just this, this variation in different ways of, of citing and referencing data, 
which can be a little bit in contrast with, with efforts in the scholarly communication landscape and our efforts to develop standards and recommendations specifically for citing data. So here in a separate question, we saw that our respondents were um, unaware of some of the citation standards which have been developed specifically for data, such as those um, developed by DataCite or by some scientific societies. Interestingly, I respondents report being most aware of data citation standards and recommendations which are created by journals and publishers um, or by citation style guidelines such as the APA or MLA standards. Uh, also interesting to point out here is that we see if respondents, if the researchers who responded to the survey were aware of these different guidelines, they do tend to use them. But these results that I show here and the ones on the previous slide, I think point to this, this tension between researchers balancing kind of their traditional ways of citing, citing papers, citing using footnotes, citing according to APA standards, and then these new ways of um, kind of new methods and, and new standards for citing data. Which brings us to the third point. Um, and at this point, I think I could, I, re, I called it balancing practice and policy here, but I think we could maybe reword it a little bit more, more provocatively. And, and this is to think about when we meet researchers actually where they are in their own practices, rather than asking them to change their practice necessarily to meet the requirements of a policy or standards. We know the power of existing norms and standards, including those of reward systems in academia, which we know are based on literature citation metrics, many of them. And we think that these may impede um, efforts to, for example, include data citations in reference lists. But I also think that researchers may find that their current practices are in line with the needs and expectations of their disciplinary communities. We found, for example, that most social scientists in that survey that I showed um, believe that they're citing data and they do so by mentioning data throughout the body of the publication. So I think that this really raises um, a question that's not e at all easy to answer. And it's a question that does not have a either or answer, but one that we should consider um, and do so along with researchers uh, and engage with them directly. So the fourth point, and I'm trying to be fast here, that I would close with is a, a statement that might seem like an obvious statement, but one that I think is really at the crux of many of the issues that we're facing today. And that is that managing and sharing and using data are practices which are not always easy and practices which do take work on the part of the researcher. And here I can speak from my own very meta perspective as a researcher who engages in open science, who also researches open science practices. Um, but I have gone through this process myself, this process of sharing my data and of writing a data paper. And I can say that I found the work required to go from the data preparation to the data deposit to the data paper was very detailed and very tedious and really not very interesting work. Um, it was also kind of a messy process. I had lots of questions as I did this, even though I work in this space, even though I had people to consult with. Uh, and I also struggled and spent time trying to figure out, for example, what to put in a data paper that hadn't been put in my publication where I had already reported the research results. All of this to say that this process required lots of time to figure out, lots of time to, to produce these different outputs. And it was not that easy or interesting <laughs> actually for the researcher. So this brings us to the question of how to incentivize and reward this type of data work, which again, we have seen throughout the other perspectives. This is a common theme that we often discuss. And here, one of the, the often proposed solutions is to think of data citations and metrics for data as being a way, way to kind of incentivize and reward data sharing on the part of researchers. And I do think this is important. And the results of our survey that I was discussing earlier also show that these are important to researchers. But I think other questions also need to be asked, um, questions that maybe are more basic to think about how just to reorganize other forms of, of labor in research workflows where we can give more time um, or dedicated staff to help with data management, or perhaps to think about other tasks which are 
included in academic evaluations currently, which could be taken away if we are actually adding in um, these types of data metrics and ways of evaluating data to academic evaluations in the future. So these are the four tensions which I have raised and discussed a little bit, and I think there are some nice ties to the other perspectives um, that have been brought to the table today. And so with that, I think I'll just thank you all for your attention and open it for further discussion and share it back with Rachel here. Excellent. Um, Zed, thank you. Um, and thanks, Kathleen. That was a really, um, it was a really, as you said, nice, um, I want to say, like, kind of wrap up, you've sort of saved me a job. But as said, I think that we're all really, you know, sort of conscious of all of the, and, and that we don't want to make assumptions, and that we don't want to make assumptions on, um, while, you know, based on, you know, based on something like discipline, based on workflows or just, you know, sort of adding to, you know, the, the work that researchers are, are, are having to, are having to do, um, to be able to, to be able to do this. Um, we don't have a ton of time for questions. Um, I was, you know, very happy that, folks were able to kind of share their expertise and any questions that have been asked in the chat and that haven't been answered we will follow up with afterwards what I did want to do just to kind of um to I think as a as a kind of proper wrap up but um ideally a brief one is um I guess if each of the panelists here's here's your here's your um here's your task um I'd been thinking about what we can do as a community to best support data sharing. Um, you can jump in at your leisure, but I guess sort of one thing that's kind of top of mind or the 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 first thing that we should that we should try to tackle. Um, I think that would be really interesting. Um, instead, there's a range of perspectives in the chat from librarian to publisher, um, which we can all probably speak to. So. Um, I'd open the floor to the, the panelists with, I guess, a kind of thought on that. Um, I don't know who wants to jump in first. I can go first. Since, since I went last, maybe I'll just add my, Perfect. add my comment first here. And this is really inspired by something that Shelley mentioned on her slides also. And I think it's the point that a lot of this work is collaborative work. Uh, and I think that by encouraging data sharing and data citation and data reuse within the the smaller community or smaller team is really an important way to reach researchers and to encourage um, yeah, a change in practice. And that also addresses problems with um, when people leave research teams, then maybe the entire team has more of a responsibility around making, making research data available and encouraging this change. Cool. No, I, I, that's a great point. Thank you. Shelley, I'll go to you next, then Arvind, and then I will finish with Sarah. I, I, I feel like Kathleen and I are, are, are sisters from the same mother. Um, it, it, so building on what she just said, um, you know, it really, a researcher makes change only when they see value in doing so. And I think really helping them understand what it means to, and th this is a term that I use uh, within the work I do, a digital presence you know, your ORCID and how it connects and how you can build out your networks and your collaborators, your papers, your data, your software are all connected um, and, you know, helping them see that value for themselves. And then um, what does that mean uh, in a team when you, uh, you know, I, I have a team, um, uh, I've, let's, no, let me say it differently. I've heard about a team where uh, the software developer won't share the model with anybody else because there's no clarification that full attribution will be given to them and they think somebody else on the team is going to give it to some one of their friends and this is a real issue we have to make sure that there is clarity in software being its own research product it has to be given attribution you have to respect that work and and also then feel comfortable uh with guidance for you know what your lab code of conduct is that you, you cannot just go willy-nilly with somebody else's work when they are openly sharing it within your team. So there, 
there is real issues around this. And we have to be really clear on these research products being valuable for not only sharing within a team, but also treated as a product outside uh, with full attribution and credit, so. Perfect, yep. Um, Arvind? Yeah, I just had a couple of points. One is, um, of course, we are sort of discussing about uh, the importance of making publications, you know, immediately uh, uh, sort of removing the embargo and making it all open. The other aspect, the, the equal responsibility that lies in the authors as well. Uh, I'm aware that a lot of publishers do uh, sort of suggest um, authors to cite uh, the data uh, that they use clearly. But I think the authors should uh, play their part in citing their data well, because that sort of opens up the Pandora box. Um, yeah, and the other um, thing is uh, about fair data. I mean, you can't stress enough the importance of fair data and how we could, uh, um, the veracity that it brings on to uh, the research uh, is, uh, it, it's in totally another level. Um, so yeah, it, it, we have to uh, contact and uh, encourage authors to uh, be part of this as well. Yeah, I agree. Um, Sarah, I would I would emphasize uh, the importance of data curation and providing support for data curation. It's it's a you know it's a skill that that has it's its own skill set it has its own uh you know there are there are experts who are equipped to do data curation that shouldn't be left to researchers to have to do on their own they i think you know going back to kathleen's point of you know what can we take off researchers plates i think you know curation is not um, does not need to be the responsibility of researchers and it isn't necessarily the right responsibility of research because researchers because it is its own skill set um so making sure that that is supported um and i think that's something that the, the you know the journal publishers and editors in the room can probably understand we don't have authors do their own copy editing we don't have authors do their their own uh, production and you know and all of that the the work that that we do for those types of publications and we should be treating data the same way excellent that's a great point to finish on i won't uh, i won't add any more thank you all so much for your time and attention for attending the webinar today and for um, and for for staying, contributing with your questions um, and and other input in the chat. Final thank you to the panelists, and um, yeah, hopefully see you on the the next OASPA webinar. Thank you.